You're watching the Law and Crime Network, folks. I'm Aaron Keller. I'll be with you for the afternoon hours here. And you were just listening to a little bit of the opening statement from Wallace Bradshaw. He's a former prosecutor. If he sounds like one, that's why. Well, this time he's in the defendant's chair. The accusation is this financial wife swap with a neighboring county judicial district prosecutor. That defendant, who you saw right there, who was the prosecutor, had his wife working for him at one point, and the ethics authority said, oh, that's not ethical. You can't be paying your wife, whom you're also supervising. That's illegal in North Carolina. The allegation from the state is that that defendant swapped wives, at least professionally, with the neighboring prosecutor. The neighboring prosecutor was on the stand earlier in this case, testifying against Wallace Bradshaw, the defendant. How's the state going to prove its case? It looks like to some of us here at Law and Crime that the state's case is getting a little bit tricky, but we're going to get into that in a little bit. We are still in session in that court. There is a witness on the stand going over very lengthy financial data. It's pretty dry testimony, folks, so we're going to talk about yet another case and bring you back to Wallace Bradshaw as soon as things pick up. That case is the Harvey Weinstein case, the movie mogul pleaded not guilty to charges of rape and sex assault here in New York City. To help us break down what's happening with him, my old arch nemesis, Julie Rendleman, is here with me today. Julie, you're a New York former prosecutor, current defense attorney. You have a third title that you've forbidden me to utter, <laughs> exactly. so I won't say it. Folks watching at home can presumably see it at yes. the bottom of the screen. How so are you? I'm, I'm well, Julie. It's you. been a while Good since I've see seen you. you. Good to see you. So what do you make of this Harvey Weinstein case? You used to sit in the shoes of the people prosecuting him, and now you sit in the shoes of people who defend him. Right. You're not involved in the case, but you practice here in New York City, sure. so you know the ins and outs of it. I know one question a lot, of it, a lot of us had at the beginning, and a lot of people were saying, well, look, he's a rich celebrity. Does he get some kind of special treatment? And we were of the impression that really, no, there's no special treatment for people here. I, I mean, there's special treatment because he has money. And so, it, it, so there, so how do we say this? So the fact that he knew that there was an investigation going on against him and because he has money allowed him to hire an attorney who could reach out to the DA's office to find out if in fact there was a grand jury proceeding going on. Many people who are indigent whether they know that there's investigation going on or not, really can't do anything because they can't hire an attorney to help them kind of through that through that process. Not at that stage, of course. Certainly not at that stage. There's a constitutional right to an exactly. attorney. Exactly, but we're but, talking but about attaches, free arrest. Yes, that only attaches after, exactly. you know, Jeopardy picks up here. Exactly. And so if we're going to be, you know, if we're going to be specific, then yes, he does bear, get a benefit. In terms of how he was treated on that day that everyone was talking about, that he got to come in with his attorney, turn himself in, that's pretty normal on cases in which they've already hired their own attorney. We, it happens all the time that the district attorney's office and the defendant uh, and the defense attorney will agree to a date. They'll agree to the amount of bail, if there's going to be bail. If they disagree, then that's going to be an argument before the, the judge. Um, and they'll agree um, to a new date. And so that's not so unusual. They'll bring him in in the morning. They'll process him, meaning take his fingerprints, take a picture of him, bring him before the judge, and it's a pretty quick process. So no, he's not treated differently than many other individuals who can afford a private attorney. Other than that, though, it, the process just rolled out the way it exactly normally would for same. anybody. Exactly the same. Some believe that the million dollars or the ten million over the mil a million was not fair because he's a he he it, to him that's nothing, and so that might have been something that caused individuals to be concerned. However, keeping in mind that he got an ankle bracelet, which means that he can't travel uh, to to the places he would like to travel, he can't leave the country, and so those are added things that many. Uh, defendants in his position would not have gotten. So some may argue, if you choose to, that he was treated more harshly because of the situation with the ankle bracelet as well as the, the extensive amount of bail. Well, certainly your experience helps us understand what's going on, at least with local procedure here. But let's talk about the simple plea. I mean, sure. that, that's run of the mill, uh, not really a surprise. He says that anything no. sexual was consensual, and that's his story, and he seems to be sticking to it thus far. That's yeah. what's new. That just came within the last uh, 24, 48 hours. Sure. It's not unusual that when you uh, appear at arraignment for the first time, unless there's an agreed-upon plea, that an individual comes in and pleads not guilty. Um, and so it's for at this point, at this stage, is where the prosecution is, 
is going to be obligated to turn over discovery to the defense counsel. And that discovery includes potentially, if it exists, any evidence that could help the defense, we call it Brady material. Uh, you know, that's what that's the name for From it. From the but U.S. Supreme Court case, exactly. Certainly. But it's any evidence that would be beneficial to the defendant. And so, it's kind of a, a lengthy proceeding. There's going to be motion practice, and they're going to begin to turn over paperwork. And I, I can be confident, and I'm sure we all agree that the defense is going to be working diligently on their own investigation, if they haven't already, which we know they have. Um, into the various potential, not just the victims, the ones on the indictment, but any other potential witnesses that they think would potentially come out of the woodwork to be called to testify on the now, prosecution's behalf. We don't officially know the names of the two women for whom these charges surround. Is it likely, is it possible that Harvey Weinstein knows those names? Well, we know that, we believe that he knows at least one of them. The reason we know that is because, remember, they give specific dates and times of when the incidents happen. So naturally, um, Mr. Brackman there, and his defense attorney and the defendant can figure out, based on that, who they're talking about. And it seemed that they're referring and seemed to know that at least one of the alleged victims is someone that he is intimating he had a sexual consensual relationship to with, which can hurt the prosecution. However, we can't forget that even those in consensual relationships can have a scenario of which an individual is forcibly raped or sexually assaulted. Certainly. So, okay, we we know that. We assume that he should know the identity of at least one of the people, if not both, okay? Right. Assuming he was there, okay? But here's a case where there are some 70 women who have come forward and made some sort of accusation against the guy. Is this going to be a situation like Cosby Trial 1, or is it going to be a situation like Cosby Trial 2? Are we going to have all of them lumped in together with all of them who want to testify being allowed to testify under the presumption this was a common scheme or plan and we talk about this all the time can prosecutors take all of this evidence of all of the alleged bad acts and throw them into a case that really only deals with uh, two bad acts they're, or a few bad acts. They're not supposed to. Um, you know, there are exceptions to the rule. And, um, you know, one would argue that the Cosby scenario of which the individuals were given medication that put them to sleep or made them drowsy was more specific and more particular and unusual. More, more of a specific scheme or scheme plan. Scheme or plan yes. than in a scenario where he's being a accused of various different things, whether it be touching women inappropriately on their breasts, raping, like all the various crimes that don't seem to be one common scheme or plan. I also think uh, in New York, it's a bit more liberal. So I think the judge will be more strict about what, if anything, he allows in outside of the two victims. Yes, that, that's interesting to look at. And another thing here is in New York, you still have different charges for the alleged rape, the alleged sex assault. I know one of the states where I'm from, uh, because at this point I'm from several, is... What uh, state they, are you from? Uh, I'm from none <laughs> at this point. So right. uh, or, uh, originally a native New Yorker, but not downstate. I, yes, I'm, from, I I'm from upstate. So, you know, look, um, some states have collapsed all these into one charge and, and said you don't need to get into specifics. It, it, you know, anything that's that's an unwanted sexual touching is is uh, in New Hampshire. It's AFSA aggravated aggravated felonious sexual assault, right. and they lump it all in together. In New York, you still have all these different charges. Right. And from a public perspective, it just sort of makes the conduct more clear to understand because. There's one rape charge against Harvey Weinstein and one sex assault charge, so you have different types of acts being alleged here. Right. I would argue that as it relates to trying to bring the accusations of all the 70 women in, that therefore, because you have different types of acts, none of the other accusations come in because it's different conduct. I agree, with, I, well, but I think that's my point, and that's kind of why Bill Cosby is very different, because all the women seem to have the same exact description of what transpired with Bill Cosby. They don't have that with Mr. Weinstein, and so I think that's a problem for them. I think part of the prosecutor's um, tactics were to put together two separate crimes from two separate women in the hopes that one would help the other and the other would help the other, you know, like kind of that they'd work together. So therefore, if the jury didn't buy one of their stories, they might buy it more because there's another woman saying something similar. Will the defense move to separate these? 
Right, and he may be successful. I don't know. I mean, he's going to, there'll, there'll be a motion to sever, um, and the judge will rule on that. Um, I don't know the specifics as to the time frame for each of these. I know the years are quite different. Um, and so he may have a leg to stand on in terms of um, that argument as well. Why did the prosecutor move forward with these two specific charges and not perhaps with some of the other uh, 68 accusations that apparently are floating out? There? I mean, we can be guessing that a lot of them were beyond the statute of limitations. Um, and so I, I think that's one issue. Um, I think two, um, potentially, you know, look, I assume that they did a thorough investigation of each of these individuals, and I assume that they picked those that didn't have baggage or at least had the least amount of baggage. And I hate to say that, but when you're a prosecutor, and, and I have to defend the prosecutor's office for this, and there's an accusation made, you have to make a determination as to whether or not the complainant is credible. We just had a case recently where a woman accused two boys of raping her, and it turned out about a year later that she admitted to lying about it. We're going to talk about that one in a little bit, because I was in the courtroom yesterday, in the courtroom when the plea went down. That's why I and, wasn't and here. I, and we talk about it because we must, must, must recognize that an accusation is an accusation. And so as prosecutors, our job is not just to buy what someone's telling us, but to listen to what they have to say, see if there's corroboration, and question and make sure that that person is telling the truth. Because making these type of allegations and going so far as to arrest an individual is extremely, 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 um, you know, can destroy someone's life if it's not accurate. Any sense of what the defense might be? Can you look into the crystal ball or is it way too early for that? I think it's way too early. I think Ben Braffman is incredibly aggressive. I think he got caught up in some of the comments he made regarding, um, I, I think it was the casting couch with, I think, um, met with a lot of uh, individuals that were very offended because the question isn't whether or not there was a casting couch. The question is whether or not his client committed these crimes. And I think that this is going to come down to a simple thing, which is the credibility of the complainants. These are old cases. Um, there's no DNA, potentially. I doubt there is. And so therefore, because there's a lack of forensics, there's going to be he said, she said. We're going to continue to follow that Harvey Weinstein case. We're going to switch back, though, to the Wallace Bradshaw case in North Carolina. Again, this is the case of the former prosecutor who's now sitting in the defendant's chair defending himself on charges that he had this uh, either no-show job scheme or wife swap job scheme. It's basically official corruption, folks. It's being alleged here where one judicial district prosecutor allegedly made a deal with a prosecutor in the neighboring district whereby they would hire one another's wives, making one another money, and that it raised all sorts of ethical issues. The allegation is that the neighboring prosecutor's wife was getting paid $48,000 a year while going to nursing school. But was she in school full time? Was she in school just for one class? There were a lot of factual discrepancies with the state's case. And some of the testimony, I think, from that neighboring prosecutor, Mr. Blitzer, just didn't seem to match up quite as nicely with the state's theory of the case in opening statements as perhaps jurors might have liked. So is the defendant edging a little bit closer to winning the case here? That's the question. There's some financial testimony going on in that courtroom right now. It's pretty dry. So we're going to dial back to the beginning of the case. This is Wallace Bratcher, former defense attorney, who then became a prosecutor, now defending himself on charges of official corruption. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to the Wallace Bradshaw case from North Carolina. It's an official corruption case where one prosecutor in one county is accused of hiring the wife of a prosecutor in another county, in a neighboring county, in fact, and vice versa. Two prosecutors hiring one another's wives. One of the prosecutor's wives stops working. That's the allegation in order to go back to nursing school full time, apparently, after some discussions about doing it part time. The details get in the weeds, and that's why you have so much intricate evidence in this case, such as the last witness, someone who works for the State Administrative Office of the Courts, or the AOC. If you hear AOC, that's what it is, Administrative Office of the Courts. They're in North Carolina. The witness who was just on the stand going copiously over the financial records and the time card system in this case there's the two people suspected in this who you saw on your screen right there. The first one was the defendant. The second one was Blitzer. Blitzer 
copped a plea in this case and basically walked away uh, with but one charge, and that charge apparently might go away if they like his testimony at trial. The interesting thing is that guy right there, Blitzer, he was on the stand. His wife was the one that was going to nursing school uh, and basically collecting this $48,000 salary. This was an intricate case with a lot of moving parts. The devil's in the details, as perhaps the prosecutor might say. Julie Rendleman is still here with me. Also another guest here on the Law and Crime Network, Steve Mulroy, is joining us. He's a former federal prosecutor. We're going to try to break some of this down during the break. Uh, Stephen, good to see you here on Law and Crime. Well, thank you very much. I'm talking from the University of Memphis. Law school, which is where I teach criminal law. Yes, okay, so let's talk about what's going on in this case as the jurors take a break here. Uh, I said before, the devils are in the detail in this, and I think you both probably agree, so Stephen, let me start with you. Um, this is one of these cases that the, the jurors have got to listen to every little detail here. And this, la this last witness, talking about this time card system, apparently people were supposed to enter their hours, but half the time nobody is approving the hours anywhere. And really, the only thing that that time card system influences is vacation and sick time accrual. So why is the prosecutor making such a huge deal about whether or not this time card system was right up to snuff? Well, uh, in order to uh, get a conviction on the uh, essentially fraud charges that are the most serious charges here, the prosecutor is going to have to get the jury to conclude beyond a reasonable doubt that they're intent to deceive on the part of the defendant. And perhaps the best way to do that is to show that if the, the life involved was deliberately filling out time cards that claimed that she was working or the, the defendant was signing off on or knew about cards that basically represented an affirmative representation of work being when it wasn't, well, that's the falsehood. That's the intent to deceive right there. Well, this is a convoluted case because the woman who was basically accused of not working and getting paid wasn't the wife of this defendant. Right. It was the wife of the other defendant. And a lot of people are probably sitting there, wait a minute, why don't you go after the person who apparently was doing nothing and sucking down the $48,000 salary? So, Julie, you're grimacing a little bit. I see it out of the corner of my eye. You probably disagree with me somehow. Well, I, I, because I understand that when you look at it um, superficially, that the only person that's benefiting is Blitzer and his wife. But the benefit is that neither of them could hire their own wife. The idea was for them each to exchange wives, in a sense, so that there wouldn't be that conflict. So the benefit he receives is that now his wife gets to work for Blitzer, and Blitzer's wife gets to work for him. So although he's not getting the benefit of having his wife not work and make money, he is getting the benefit of his wife being able to work for another agency in exchange for Blitzer's wife basically not working. So you know, A lot of people are going to look at that, Julia. They're going to look at it and say, okay, look, Blitzer's wife was sucking down the salary, at least that's the accusation, doing either next to nothing or not enough. And why is he walking away uh, pretty scot-free here as far as criminal charges go? Look, he gave up his law license. Um, he wound up having to pay back the money. Okay, that, that happened. But, you know, he, he's, he's walking away with but one criminal charge, which might itself apparently get wiped clean if the state likes his testimony against this guy. So is that ultimately justice here? Stephen, what do you think? Well, as to the question of whether you go after the actual district attorney who hired the person that wasn't doing the work or the person that was doing the work herself, I, I think you can see the, there's an argument here that, you know, he had a position of trust and he abused that trust. So it's important to you know ensure public integrity to make sure that he's held accountable. So that's why you go after him instead of just the woman that was doing the, uh, the work. Uh, further, I think, as Julie already mentioned, there's sort of a conspiracy element here. And then the two district attorneys agreed to, to swap lives as workers get around uh, otherwise conflict of interest provisions, uh, allegedly knowing that they would both be participating in a situation, which, and at least one of them wasn't going to be giving a full day's work for a full day's pay, kind of like a Alfred Hitchcock, uh, Strangers on a Train scenario, the, the two yeah, people I mean, swap victims, you know. So, Ju Julie, let me, let me put the question this way. So you, you've got Blitzer. He got up on the witness stand. He was up there for part of one day and part of another day here. 
okay, uh, at a minimum. And he's the one whose wife was going to nursing school and basically uh, apparently not working for the prosecutor's office. How is it that prosecutors decided to go after one guy full throttle and pretty much let the other guy off the hook for some testimony against the other one? Well, I think um, Mr. Mueller spoke to that to, to a degree by saying basically, you know, First of all, we don't know what happened prior to this. We don't know if there was plea negotiations with Mr. Bradshaw and he chose not to, and so therefore he became more of the focus. We just don't know, and sometimes it becomes as simple as which defendant comes into the room quicker to give their take on what happened, and it may just be that um, the co-defendant got there quicker, um, and so they ended up focusing on the other guy. Um, you know, I do have to say, you know, irregardless of me saying that th there's a potential, um, you know, conspiracy, I do think there's a problem proving that Bradshaw knew there was, in fact, a fraud, uh, because at least from the start, the women both were working, so I'm not real. I'm still missing something, but but usually I am missing something. So, <laughs> Stephen, do you want to take yeah. a crack at educating Julie? Yeah, no, no. I mean, I think that what uh, and I'll uh, Rendleman um, <laughs> said was uh, correct. I didn't mean to be uh, too forward earlier when I used the first name, but uh, I I think what she's saying is essentially correct. I mean, from what I understand, and the facts are confusing here, it's more clear that the, um, the wife that was working for the defendants wasn't giving a full day's work for a full day's pay. And so since the defendant was the actual boss in that situation, it's the more legally relevant relationship. The boss that allows the public to be defrauded is the person you go after, not the, not the husband of the person that was primarily responsible for doing the defrauding. So that's one reason for maybe going a little on the, this defendant, and then the other, as I think Ms. Rendleman said, is the other district attorney was was came in first. He decided to cooperate first, and well, sometimes the person that decides to cooperate first gets off easier. I really, yeah. I really like having you because you agree with me sometimes, and so that really <laughs> well, look, makes it all the more enjoyable. Everyone earlier, Ms. Rendleman, <clears throat> <laughs> heard you call me shallow, and uh, that did go out over the air. Um, but look. Um, one thing that I am wondering about and a number of us are wondering about here is how is it that the prosecutors are the ones who are getting in all this trouble? Why aren't the wives getting in trouble? I, Julie, I think, do you I, want to take I, a crack? I mean, I yeah. think, and I'm going to call him Steve, I think he, I think we both agree that the people that, look, I mean, the idea that the co-defendant um, took a plea, part of it was to keep his wife out of trouble. Um, and so, again, we go back to kind of when we, when we think about um, the community's trust in, you know, someone in authority, the DAs, the district attorneys of each of these uh, various counties, were the ones that were in that position of trust, and I think much more so than the wives. And so the fact that they're the ones that are allowing their wives to do this, one of the wives to not work, I think is going to be more um, offensive to the community than simply the wives um, choosing not to work and, uh, and, and getting paid. Yeah, would okay, we're going to take a quick break away from this discussion. Folks, the jurors are on uh, mid-afternoon break. The judge told us at the beginning of this case that those breaks would be about 15 minutes long. We are waiting to see when this case picks back up. In the meantime, let's dial back to some of the opening statements from the defendant himself. Keep in mind, he was a seasoned and apparently very successful defense attorney before he became a very successful prosecutor. He's been in this on both ends of the thing. Uh, and now he's in the defendant's chair. Let's listen to some of his opening statements. Welcome back, everybody. That was Wallace Bradshaw. He's facing basically what amount to official corruption and misconduct charges in North Carolina, a series of charges related to this sort of bizarre wife employment swap. The prosecutor on his own opening statement called it a wife swap. That was the prosecutor's words, only this time it happened at work. The accusation is that that defendant, who used to be the district attorney, lined up a deal with a neighboring judicial district district attorney, whereby they would hire one another's wives. 
The trick was that the other district attorney's wife, who was working for that defendant, apparently wasn't showing up at work and was still raking down a $48,000 salary. This is a case where the details are extremely important. And just on the witness stand, we had a representative from the Office of the Court Administrator in North Carolina basically saying, look, we've got this time card system, but a lot of times it's a mess. Hours are not getting approved across the state. And even if the hours are approved, it doesn't really mean much because the only thing the system does for salaried employees is accrue sick time and vacation time. So we've spent a lot of time going into details here. And I have to wonder, folks, if the state is just grasping at things if they don't have a strong enough case. Stephen Mulroy is a former federal prosecutor. He teaches criminal law in Memphis, Tennessee. Julie Rendleman is a person of three titles, including law and crime trial analyst. She also practices law here in New York City. So, folks, what do you think? So much of the evidence in this just seems to be really minute, and there seems to be at least two different versions of this story. Does that hurt the case for the state, or does it help the case for the state? Julie, I'll start with you. Um, I, I, the one thing I will say is that if it's convoluted for us, then imagine uh, the, the jury who's listening to this. Now, one of the things I will say is that I haven't been listening to this case from beginning to end, and I think this is you know, unique to some of the other cases. You really need to be listening to the finite details of every single thing that's come in so far. Um, and so I think I'm at... Um, a little bit of a disadvantage of maybe missing things that I think would be relevant. But I do think, based on everyone I've spoken to and that of which I've listened to, that the convoluted story is going to benefit uh, the, the, the defense in this case, because if they don't understand it, they're more likely not to find him guilty. Well, that would be the case as far as burden to proof. The state needs to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. Stephen Mulroy, what do you think? Well, because of the burden to prove beyond a reasonable doubt guilt, then any confusion because of the convoluted details obviously is going to benefit the defense and hurt the prosecution. Um, I think that uh, Julie made a good point, though, that we haven't seen the entire trial. The, the, the actual theory of the prosecution's case isn't that complicated. The two DAs couldn't hire their own wives, so they swapped wives as employees, and at least one of them wasn't really going up to work, but getting paid anyway. I mean, any juror can understand that. That's pretty simple. Now, if the way you go about proving that is through convoluted details of our records that apparently no one was really filling out faithfully anyway, well, then that can be a, a problem for the prosecution. But, but the overall theory is not that uh, complicated, it seems to me. It is and it isn't. I think the evidence by which they have to get there is a little more complicated than perhaps the prosecutor made it out on opening statements. And there's always that fear of selling a case that doesn't completely come to fruition. I thought that the last witness who was on the stand uh, whose testimony may be continuing when they come back from break, we'll have to keep an eye on that, uh, seemed at times to be sort of disagreeing with the prosecutor's assertions, and a lot of times juries don't take that very well. But I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about another case. This one I just happened to be in the courtroom for. This was the Nikki Yovino case out of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, I was there yesterday because we were expecting to get ready for a jury trial on charges that this young woman, who was formerly a college student in Connecticut, made up an accusation that she had been raped by a couple of African-American athletes. Ultimately, in a surprise move, just minutes before jury selection would start to begin, that young woman copped a plea and said, I made the whole thing up. Prosecutors, you had the story right. She agreed with the basic state theory that she made up this case about a couple of athletes sexually assaulting and raping her after a 2016 party in the fall of the 2016 semester it was an unfortunate situation for those athletes. They wound up losing scholarships. One of them quit college altogether. The other one remained in college uh, ultimately and is trying to work his way through things. But what do you folks make of this? Julie, you were a prosecutor here in New York City, now criminal defense attorney. Is it rare for a prosecutor to go after someone who claims to be a rape victim and who then they think is making the story up? 
Is it rare for that sort of person to get charged? It's not. I'll be honest. It's rare, and 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 the truth is, it should happen much more frequently because I think that when you make an accusation as serious as that, and you're not being forthright, then there has to be. And I hate to say, held to pay because. Um, you know, you have now impacted the lives of not just the prosecutors handling the case, but you have destroyed the lives, especially in a case that's as serious as this, of the individuals that whose accusations um, were made against. Keep in mind, even now that she's admitted to lying, it still ha will forever impact them as the two young men that were involved in this potential sexual assault, because people will still say, well, maybe, oh, maybe she's lying about lying, you know, so so her... And indeed, that, that's going on. Apparently, some of the victims' rights groups in that area in uh, southern Connecticut uh, are still supporting her, but she, I was sitting 15 feet away from her when she got up to the microphone in front of the judge and said, yes, Your Honor, I made it all up, in essence. That was, in essence, the plea. Uh, Stephen, uh, I have to credit the defense attorneys in this case, though, who, who uh, basically just said it's a sad day for everyone and that everyone's looking forward to the process of healing now. That's, that's what they told me yesterday on the record. Uh, but, Stephen, I've got to give the defense credit in this case because the defense was able to take a felony and a misdemeanor that could have resulted in uh, many years in prison. I think it was six years or something like that if convicted. And they knocked it down to uh, three misdemeanors. Uh, which will result basically in, uh, if everything rolls out the way people think, uh, a year in jail, okay, not prison, but local jail, and then basically what amounts to a three-year probation where if she, if she gets in trouble, she'll have to serve a total of three years, uh, but if she doesn't, she gets out after a year. Now, that seemed like pretty skillful defense work. Well, I, yeah, I think that compared to what she was staring down the barrel of, uh, what she got was pretty good. Now, I understand that the judge at one point had suggested a one-year sentence, and she had originally turned that down, but then changed her mind and, and, and grabbed her. And I think that was probably smart, because if they had convicted her, she could have possibly got something uh, far worse. You know, uh, I... I think given the gravity of what she did, you know, one year in jail is not, uh, you know, it's going to shock the conscience of anybody. Uh, you know, in terms of the effect on these people's lives, one of them lost a scholarship, the other one dropped out of college. And as you pointed out, the truth is never going to completely catch up to the slander because for the rest of their lives, there'll be this cloud of doubt over them. You know, people will be wondering, well, were they the one that actually committed the rape or not? I agree, I, and I think a number of people agree. I also spoke with a civil attorney, one of, I think, a couple of civil attorneys who are representing the athletes who were accused in this case. And look, uh, the attorney told me after court yesterday on the record that uh, those athletes who, uh, by this plea, were falsely accused by that young woman uh, and uh, that a civil case may follow. Now, once you have a plea in a criminal case, a civil judgment is a pretty sure bet here, correct? Yes, yes. The, well, the, the standard of proof is higher in a criminal case than in a civil case, so if uh, a guilty plea is basically the, the, the finding that beyond a reasonable doubt, this person committed that crime, so for the civil case where it's simply preponderance of the evidence, a civil judgment, as you said, should be pretty easy to get. And oftentimes, uh, Julie, look, we miss here sitting in a studio in Midtown Manhattan the nuances of the local courtroom. And uh, this one, uh, it was pretty clear that there were a lot of people there to support the uh, purported, uh, uh, the accused athletes, at one point accused, uh, now uh, in uh, at least 99% uh, percent of the opinions out there vindicated. Uh, you know, look, there was a lot of uh, a lot of hard. There were a lot of hard feelings in that courtroom yesterday because you got a family, a family members of a couple of standout athletes who had good scholarships to uh, a university and uh, whose lives were thrown completely into uh, upheaval here, as we've been saying. And they're sitting in a pretty small courtroom. Okay, there's only I think there were three rows of chairs 
in the room where they eventually held this. So everybody's crammed in together. It's the victim's family uh, and uh, the defendant's family. And, and I say victim's family to describe the athletes because that's how the state described them when the state was up making uh, arguments in front of the judge. Say, hey, they are victims. They were falsely accused. And oftentimes here, we don't get to see any of that on law and crime. We don't get to pick it up. But but look, it was pretty raw in that courtroom. I think, you know, we have to realize, like, in the in the age of the Me Too movement, we have to recognize the other side of things. And so the other side of things is that an accusation is an accusation. And it's incumbent on the prosecutor's office, law enforcement, to make sure. And, and again, they can't always get it right. We don't we understand that. But to make sure that when an allegation is made, especially in a case that is as serious as this, that they make sure that they are guaranteeing or doing the best they can to guarantee the credibility of the complainant. Um, and so I don't know what happened in this case. I don't know if they did their due diligence or not. But if they didn't, then they are just as responsible as she is, in, or at least partially responsible for not doing their job either. Well, I, I wasn't part of this investigation, but if I were to take a guess, I, from, from the vibe in the room, it was pretty clear uh, in the minds of a lot of the investigators that something was fishy about this. Okay, look, this particular uh, now defendant who once claimed she was a victim uh, went to the hospital to get checked. And look, I mean, they collect evidence. Well, stories started changing and then changing again. And uh, I think that the investigators who are seasoned in this kind of work probably could uh, smell smoke and suspect fire and suspect that somebody was making something up. And that's how this rolled along. So. Uh, wanted to discuss that. We were hoping to bring you the uh, trial here on Law and Crime. Uh, we were all set, and uh, since it was pretty close by to our studios here in Manhattan, uh, I was actually in the courtroom for this yesterday, waiting for jury selection to pick up. Whoops. They brought us into a different courtroom, and it resulted in a plea agreement, ultimately three misdemeanors for Nikki Yovino. We're going to switch back, though, now to the Wallace Bradshaw case out of North Carolina. That's the official corruption case that's being heard there, the accusation of wife swapping, at least professionally, from one district attorney to another. There is uh, some more testimony happening after an afternoon break in that case. It's the same witness who was on the stand before from the state administrative office of the courts going through the copious time records. Is it going to help the prosecutor's case? Let's go back live to that case in North Carolina. This is the Wallace Bradshaw trial in North Carolina. The defendant sitting right in the middle of your screen there. He just now taking a quick drink of water. He was a successful defense attorney in rural North Carolina who ran for prosecutor. He said because he ultimately uh, was watching his local prosecutor botch a bunch of cases. So he took the office over after winning an election, says that he increased prosecu prosecution rates, increased arrests, and was pretty successful as a prosecutor. Well, at some point, he made a deal, according to prosecutors in this case, to hire the wife of a neighboring county prosecutor. The neighboring county prosecutor, Craig Blitzer, hired that defendant's wife each prosecutor hiring one another's wives, and down it went. This is basically an official corruption trial. That defendant accused of hiring the wife of a neighboring prosecutor. The key witness we're hearing is going to be next. That's Cindy Blitzer. She's the one who was working, allegedly getting paid for allegedly working while she was really going to nursing school. It looks like she's about to take the witness stand. This is the witness we were all waiting to see if she would indeed take the stand. Julie Rendleman is nodding. Yes, this is what we were waiting for. Looking forward to it. This is the person accused of playing the key role in this. And it looks like she's getting some dis some instructions from the judge or, or perhaps uh, they're getting close to uh, uh, getting uh, some kind of an oath. But and, and my producer, Virginia, is pointing out the jury was sent out of the room here. So this might be some... Um, uh, some sort of a proffer or something like that, I'm guessing, right, Julie? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think she'd be pleading the fifth. Um, it's possible that she could be. I'm, 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 are we able to hear what's going on or, or no? We, we don't have it up yet, so uh, that's possible that they could be going over a waiver of some kind of a Fifth Amendment right or something here. Uh, let's listen to this. This might be critical.
folks, the key witness is going to take the stand in just a couple of minutes in the trial of uh, the prosecutor who allegedly hired her without having her show up to work. She was making $48,000 a year in what could be described as a no-show job scandal between one prosecutor and a neighboring prosecutor, this witness's husband. Apparently, they swapped wives, professionally speaking, hired one another's wives. It resulted in criminal charges for both the neighboring prosecutor, Craig Blitzer, this witness's husband, testified. Now the wife might testify or is apparently going to testify as soon as the jury comes in. Julie, you called it. That's exactly what this was, a waiver of Fifth Amendment rights. Yes, yes. And so, I, 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 you know, it has to be done in, in not... It has to be done not in front of the jury. I'm sorry, what? I, I think we were getting some instruction, and oh, I think sorry. it derailed your train of thought. So we were looking on the screen uh, just a couple of seconds ago at, at the wife of the defendant in this particular case. That was uh, Pam Bradsher. Her husband is now the one you see on the screen right there. And uh, he's the one on trial, former defense attorney who then ran and won a seat as prosecutor. And he brought his wife, who we just saw a second ago, with him to his office. And look, uh, then when there were ethics complaints, ethics issues raised, this whole house of cards, at least in the prosecution's view, fell apart. Let's go to this testimony. This is going to be a key witness for the state. Welcome back, everybody. We saw that key witness, Cindy Blitzer, in the Wallace Bradshaw case. It's an official corruption case out of North Carolina where one prosecutor in one judicial district is accused of hiring the woman who's on the stand right now, the wife of a prosecutor in a neighboring judicial district. Julie Rendell, your thoughts of this testimony? I know it's still going to continue, but... <laughs> I, I, I mean, we haven't heard much yet. I think, there, I, I think she's probably the most important witness that we're going to be hearing from, and I'm sure the cross-examination is going to be... Uh, pretty blistering as well so yeah you know I think the key phrase there uh, was she said that it was her husband's idea that she go work for him and how does this tie into the defendant who's sitting in the defendant's chair right now I, I'm not sure that it does but I think um, I, I assume that she's going to um, follow her husband's lead in terms of um, his testimony, I'm confident they probably spoke about it. Um, and so um, I, I assume she's going to do everything to try to back up his rendition of what transpired. Well, look, according to both of them, this basically was their idea that she work for her husband. And that's, of course, when the ethics authorities started to get involved in this. They said no, and that's what led to the swap that resulted in this trial that we're in right now. Again, as the judge said, testimony in the Wallace Bradshaw official corruption case out of North Carolina will pick up first thing in the morning. This judge is moving right along, leaving no second unspared, getting part of the testimony of that key witness in right before the end of the day. Jurors have been introduced to her. They're going to hear more from her. We're going to be back live at 9 a.m. For now, this is Aaron Keller, and for everybody here at the Law and Crime Network, have a good evening. We'll be back live tomorrow morning.